Good evening, this is TDM Talk Show. April 2nd was the World Autism Awareness Day. The United Nations has unanimously declared April 2 as the World Autism Awareness Day. Macau took part in the worldwide observance of the World Autism Awareness Day through several activities and talks organized by the Macau Autism Association. That includes a talk from a renowned Australian psychologist. Our guest for tonight is the director of OK Doki Childhood Psychology in Melbourne, Australia, and the author of various books, including Talking with Your Child About Their Autism Diagnosis, A Guide for Parents. She has extensive uh, experience working with children with development mental disabilities and their families. Let's welcome Raleen Dundon. Good evening, Raleen. It's really nice to have you here in a TDM talk show. Thanks for having me. Of course, our pleasure. For, so first of all, you were invited by the Macau Autism Association to have a talk here in Macau, basically. Yes, that's right. So uh, yesterday they held an event for families of children with autism spectrum disorder and myself and Professor Sandra Radovini, who's mm -hmm. also from Melbourne, um, came and uh, spoke to them about um, different aspects of autism and how parents could support their children. Mm -hmm. And the participants were mainly families? Yes, that's right. And did you have um, any uh, observation about the families, how they're or especially the parents, how they interacted with their children here in Macau. Um, was there any difference? So it was mostly just the parents um, at the event, so I didn't see the parents with their children, but uh, the questions that they asked um, were very typical of the kinds of questions families in Australia would ask mm -hmm. um, about their children and the kinds of difficulties that, that they might have with, um, with their behaviour and, and other things like that. that so, that's right. Yeah, it was very similar. Okay, so let's go on with knowing what this is all about. Um, what exactly are autism spectrum disorders? So autism spectrum disorders are uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So it means mm. that there is a difference in the way that a person's brain works. Right. So they perceive things differently and interpret their world a little bit mm. differently to mm -hmm. more typically developing people. Mm -hmm. um, I think the important things uh, about autism are uh, that it's lifelong. So it is something that um, from childhood mm -hmm. an individual will have all of their life mm -hmm. um, because of those differences in brain function. But they can still um, learn and uh, develop lots of skills and be part of the community, mm -hmm. just like anyone else. And there's three levels, right, for, for that? Yes, that's right. So uh, we use uh, something called the DSM-5 mm -hmm. in Australia to make diagnoses of um, children and adults with autism mm -hmm. and um, their behaviours are rated uh, over three different levels. Right. Um, so we look at their um, social communication skills mm -hmm. and we look at restricted and repetitive interests and behaviours mm -hmm. and we actually rate both of those things uh, at three different levels depending on um, how significant that difficulty is for the child. All right, and how common are autism spectrum disorders? So I think the latest statistics um, say about one in 68 One in 68? Children. Yep, so it actually is quite common. All right. Yeah, but the presentation obviously can vary a lot between one child and the next. That's right. And there's a lot of questions. What really causes autism spectrum disorders? We really still don't know. Uh, there are a lot of genes that have been identified mm -hmm. as contributing to autism. So we do see in some families that they will have uh, multiple children, perhaps, multiple. in the family that all have autism. That's right. And there might also be family members um, that also have autism diagnosis as well in their extended family. Mm -hmm. um, for other families, the child appears to come from nowhere, I guess. Uh, but I think in those families, sometimes it is about um, having other family members that might have some delays mm -hmm. or difficulties in different areas. And then um, those difficulties have come together in one particular child at a clinical level. Mm -hmm. But majority is about, it's hereditary. It seems to be mostly uh, genetic and certainly there are syndromes and other things mm -hmm. associated with specific genes um, that also um, have those children develop um, autistic characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, I think we still don't know a lot about environmental factors. So there are um, research studies being done that are looking at 
environmental influences during pregnancy, for example, um, but there's still a lot that we don't know. And that's usually about increasing the possible risk of someone having a child with autism, mm -hmm. not that it's a definite cause. That's right. And uh, how do we know the early signs of autism? I mean, how early can an autism spectrum disorder be recognized in children? So, uh, depending on the severity of their symptoms, uh, some children can be identified as early as about 18 months to, to two years. Mm -hmm. So, it can be identified very early. Uh, at that age, we're looking at uh, signs of them engaging with other people, whether they're making eye contact, whether mm -hmm. they're pointing at things and sharing experiences mm -hmm. with their parents usually. Okay. Um, and then we'd also possibly be looking at their use of language and some things like that too. But there are signs very early. Mm -hmm. um, for other children that might not be as severely impacted, it might be harder to tell that early. Okay, how hard it is, like what's the difference be between like the, the level two and the level three? So for, for a child that's really severely impacted, uh, they will be having difficulty interacting with their environment. They might not mm -hmm. be showing a lot of interest in um, their family members and people around them or things around them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that probably would be an indication that there might be um, a severe level um, of autism, but we still do look at those levels in two areas. So a child might have um, social communication skills that are not good, but not really severely impaired. So they might still be able to talk, but mm -hmm. they have trouble uh, having conversations in a social way. Okay. Um, but then they might have a lot of difficulty with restricted and repetitive behaviours. So they might engage in uh, stimming behaviours that we might see in, um, I think that are more t typically um, mm. associated with autism, like rocking, rocking. or flapping, um, spinning, some of those sorts of behaviours. So we might see those more severe in mm. some children or they might have more difficulty with um, changes in routine and unexpected things happening in their life, mm -hmm. and that might impact them a lot. All right, what do you mean by changes of routine? So uh, doing something like, uh, if a child is used to going um, and picking up a sibling from school, okay. and then the routine is they go and pick up a sibling from school, mm -hmm. and then they go to the park, and okay. then they go home and they do that most days, that might be a routine in the child's mind. And then if one day the parent says, we're picking up the sibling from school, but oh no, we have to go to the shops before we go home okay. and we're not going to the park, mm -hmm. that could be a really big change for a child with autism and they might get very, very distressed. All right, and it's just as, you can detect it as early as 18, uh, 18, 18 months. months. 18 months, in so some children. Like one year old and uh, 12, 13, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, what are the first steps after, what, what are the first steps first if you saw those signs? What do you have to do as a parent? I think the most important thing is seeking support. Mm -hmm. So if a parent is concerned about their child's development, if they don't seem to be doing the things that are usually expected for, for, for a baby or yeah. a, a toddler, then going to um, their family doctor, perhaps to start with, mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. be the best idea. Uh, and to talk to them about their concerns mm -hmm. um, and then possibly um, looking at referral to an assessment centre. All right. And what are the first steps after receiving an autism diagnosis? So I think the most important thing is uh, for parents to remember they have the same child they had the day before uh, because uh, the child hasn't changed just because mm -hmm. um, they now know they have autism. Mm -hmm it provides the parents with uh, a level of understanding that they might not have had the day before. Uh, and I think that that is really, really important. So for parents, they can experience lots and lots of different emotions. Um, some will be relieved that they have an answer to their child's difficulties. Other parents might be really distressed mm -hmm. um, about 
the possibilities of what might happen to their child um, right. and, and concerned about what the future will hold for them. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're completely reasonable reactions to have. Mm -hmm. So I think they need to seek support mm -hmm. um, and advice from professionals mm -hmm. about what therapies might be appropriate for their child to help them mm -hmm. um, and um, yet yeah, to make sure that they're seeking support for themselves mm -hmm. as well. But how do we arrange that support? So, Where do we start? Where do, you, do we go from here for all the parents out there? I think um, what I understand about Macau's system, mm -hmm. um, that referral to an assessment centre will be that first step. Mm -hmm. Having a team of um, health professionals like a paediatrician, a speech pathologist, psychologist and mm -hmm. perhaps an occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. um, assess the child, look at the skills that they have and where there are gaps mm -hmm. and then um, possibly finding that um, diagnosis right. and then referring the child on to receive some therapy and support from there. So they should be able to guide mm -hmm. the families as to what therapies are going to be most beneficial for the child. That's right and you know there's a lot of information online about therapies, treatments, yep. which is, you know, it's unbelievable, and diets for children with yes. autism. Yep. Um, let's break it down first. How do they know what's right for their children? Uh, I think every child is an individual, so mm -hmm. it is important for, for families to be aware of um, what impacts different things in their environment do have on their children. So, mm -hmm. um, for example, I do have families that um, changing their diet does seem to make a bit of a difference to their changing behaviour, their diet. changing their diet. Um, so maybe to more healthy foods, re removing preservatives, for example. No more hot dogs. <laughs> no more hot dogs, no more for bacon. For some children. <laughs> but then if your child only eats hot dogs, That's right. then you're going to want to keep giving them hot dogs so that they're, no they're getting fed. So um, <laughs> some children um, may have reactions to um, gluten or things like that, sensitivities, okay. that it might be helpful to remove from their diet, but mm. it doesn't work for everyone. So that's about knowing... Um, the child and recognising perhaps there's a change in behaviour when they eat mm -hmm. certain foods mm -hmm. and looking at uh, reducing that. But they should do that with their doctor as well, not just do it on their own. And it's not, um, it's not a blanket treatment for all children with autism. And I think right. that's the difficulty with a lot of things um, that are online. They are presented as things that are going to help all children. That's right. And they're not going to cure the child's autism. They might make it easier for them to manage their behaviour a little bit better, mm -hmm. particularly I think if they're uncomfortable or um, have dietary issues that are causing them pain by eating certain foods, removing those foods is going to make them feel better. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be able to possibly behave in slightly better ways. But uh, I don't think that it, it will uh, have a dram it's not going to have a dramatic effect on the child's characteristics of autism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we're, we're going to talk about the adults this time. Yep. Uh, are there therapies or treatments to help adults with autism? There um, are some, but I think it's something that um, we need to put a lot more time and effort into. Uh, I think there's been a lot of focus on early intervention, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Getting in early, getting the diagnosis early and helping young children mm -hmm. um, build up their skills so they're better able to manage. But there are a lot of adults now being diagnosed yeah. and certainly children that were diagnosed perhaps when they were three or four mm -hmm. eventually become adults and there are a lack of services for, um, for adults. Mm -hmm. The other thing as well is that a lot of adults with autism do experience uh, mental health issues as well and some children do also. So there are, um, there's a need for more complex mm -hmm. um, supports for them that's and right. that's something I think we need to do a lot more work and to sometimes, establish. And um, sometimes, like even relatives, we're not going to talk about parents first because parents would definitely know it right away, but some part, like members of the family, they wouldn't know. And there are also some cases that when they are adults, they don't know yet. It's very late. Um, what are we going to do with that? I mean, it's really hard for some families. I think that that's why we need more acceptance, I think, of autism, because there are still, um, unfortunately, um, a lot of negative um, feelings about having a, an autism diagnosis. The stigma. Yeah, and so a lot of parents um, are afraid to tell their children that they have autism mm -hmm. um, and certainly don't want to share that with family members 
um, or perhaps even schools or other people that might care for the child. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really, really important for children to know about their diagnosis as early as they can understand it mm -hmm. um, because it's part of who they are. And we want them to learn to embrace that and be mm -hmm. okay with that just being the way that their brain works. Mm -hmm. And if they're accepting of it, the people around them should also be able to accept um, that that's just a part of who that child mm -hmm. or that adult is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it helps them understand what they need. Mm -hmm. from, from acceptance and we're done with acceptance, for example, um, the sense of belongingness in the community, yeah. how important is Very it? Very important. Um, I think that particularly as individuals with autism get older and often recognise that they are different and they um, have difficulties in some areas, but also often have strengths and interests that um, are really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, being able to meet other people with autism is a wonderful thing to do, mm -hmm. but to also feel uh, accepted within the community so that the difficulties that they do have uh, might be being accommodated mm -hmm. um, to support them to get out and be doing things that everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, based on your experience, you've been working with these children, you've been working with the parents. Um, how should the parents respond to the behaviour of these children? I think the best way, and it's really hard <laughs> for parents, <laughs> Um, is to try and be curious about why the child is behaving in that way. Mm -hmm. So rather than being upset that they're behaving in a challenging way or feeling like the child is deliberately doing something to cause a problem, if they're curious about why the behaviour is happening and they look at the child's behaviour as um, communicating something to them, mm -hmm. so it might be that they're um, uncomfortable or anxious, mm -hmm. it might just be that they're upset at being told no. But looking at it in that way, um, I think it allows parents to be more gentle in the way that they manage mm -hmm. those situations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about supporting the child to see that that behaviour isn't effective mm -hmm. and there are better ways to um, communicate what they need. Mm -hmm. But there are parents who would say that I'm only human, sometimes I really Absolutely. get mad. Um, Behaviours that you respond to an, or to or with a negative consequence, how can they exert that patience? How are they supposed to deal with this situation? And it's really hard. They would say, like, I'm only human, I feel these things. Absolutely. I think um, for a lot of children with autism uh, and a lot of children in general, negative consequences mm -hmm. are often not very effective. So what we actually need to do is be supporting the child maybe with positive consequences and reinforcement for mm -hmm. when they're doing the things that we need them to do. Mm -hmm. um, but also looking at the behaviour from the point of view of what skill don't they have? Why aren't they managing in this situation? And if we look at it that way, rather than thinking they're doing the wrong thing, thinking why can't they behave the way that we need? What skill do we need to teach them? to help them, mm -hmm. then the outcome is going to be better overall. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that parents aren't going to have a bad day and yell mm -hmm. or um, get upset. Just lose it. Just and that's lose okay, because parents do that. But mm -hmm. something really wonderful to be able to do is to actually say to the child, I'm really sorry, I was feeling really angry okay. um, about what happened and I didn't manage my feelings very well. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is modelling to the child right. that everyone has feelings, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they get the best of us, sure. um, but um, you know we can all work on doing things better. That's right. Yeah. Um, could you cite some uh, activities that would uh, help them stimulate like their, their minds? Like, um, I don't know, when it comes to like music, visuals, do you have any advice um, I for think the parents? From, um, from the point of view of supporting the child to develop, mm -hmm. I guess things like using visuals can be really helpful um, just to help children understand their environment better or understand what's being expected of them, particularly for young children. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a really great support, even for children that can talk, mm -hmm. um, particularly because words we say them and then they disappear. Whereas if you've got a picture in front of you, That's you're going to remind the child of what you said because um, they might not have been paying attention very well mm. or they might have just been busy with something else or got distracted. Mm -hmm. And if they've got a visual, it's a much more definite way of communicating mm -hmm. um, what they need. So that's definitely something that's great. Mm -hmm. But other activities probably are activities that other children do as well. Mm -hmm. Actually 
giving them the opportunity to play sport if they're okay. interested in that, um, learn a musical instrument. Oh, that's perfect. Um, I have children that do drama classes, wow. um, are involved in um, group games. We run a, a Dungeons group and Dragons wow, social okay. skills group for teenagers. Wow, okay. um, so they come and they play Dungeons and Dragons and they think they're just playing a game with other kids mm -hmm. like them. Mm -hmm. They're actually practicing social communication skills. Would you advise, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. go on. Uh -huh. Would you advise the use of like iPads, phones? Cause like in general, like some parents just like give it to their children. I think for children with autism, for some children, for some. Um, it can be helpful because it gives the child some downtime. Okay. Particularly when social interaction can actually be really exhausting. So having some time to switch off and focus on something else can be mm -hmm. good as long as it's not all the time. Okay. I do have children that, are, that react negatively to being on screens or iPads though and so for those children it would be better not to, to introduce that. So it, it still very much depends on the child. So basically just we can also just rely on books like colorful books, you know the traditional yeah, ones. Yeah, it's, it's all about we balance. Were <laughs> yeah, it's about balance. So yes using electronics can be great but we also want them to learn to play with other toys That's right. and play with other children mm -hmm. and all of those things. We want them to have those experiences as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to reiterate it again. The social stigma of autism has been affecting both parents and their children. How should they respond to that and what can we do? Like the members of the community, what can we contribute? Because we're done with awareness, we need we are, acceptance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that acceptance comes um, into effect when we don't look strangely at a child or an adult who's flapping because they're excited when they're out somewhere or the child that is behaving in a, in a difficult way or an unusual mm. way. Mm -hmm. um, we're not walking up to a parent and saying, why aren't you managing that child better? We're understanding that, okay, that child must have some difficulties. You know, because that's you okay. wouldn't know. And that's the difficult thing, you know, autism is an invisible disorder. So mm. you don't know what's going on for that child and mm. what perhaps the parent is working very hard to teach them. So we need to allow parents to do what they need to do or know that they need to do, mm -hmm. um, but be accepting of um, the differences in the way someone might see a situation, mm -hmm. the way they might speak about a situation, um, and the sensitivities that they might have, for example, um, with sensory um, stimulation. Okay. You might see someone, and I have children that do this regularly, is they wear um, headphones everywhere they go because they're they want to be isolated. To noise. Oh, they, oh, okay. so they, they they're are, sensitive to noise. Yeah, so okay. they're happy to interact, but background noise is really distressing for them. Right. So they'll wear headphones all the time. Okay. Um, being like, we need to be okay with that. We need to say, okay, well, if that's what that person needs, then, you know, that's fine. It shouldn't impact on anyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, so rather than judging those differences, we need to mm -hmm. just say, well, that's what that person needs and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. let's move to a different level. What about the local governments? Not just the local, okay. Let, let, <laughs> what about, what, what can we do, right? Like, do we need to, to have more activities like this? More, we're done with awareness. What can they possibly do? I think um, having more um, accessible um, places for families to go, okay. um, more inclusive and supportive um, events perhaps for families to go and not feel um, like they can't participate because their child might run around and do mm -hmm. something that's not expected. Mm -hmm. And often that's why parents won't get involved with local community okay. um, events or clubs or things like that because they feel that their child's going to disrupt everything. So having maybe additional supports in place so that those children that want to participate mm -hmm. um, have people there that understand, that can support them mm -hmm. um, and allow them to actually be part of the community. Mm -hmm. Which is good because in Macau, uh, the, the government said yesterday, oh no, two days ago, yeah. that they're going to set up a care centre for people who are diagnosed with autism. Fantastic. And the construction will only begin in 2020, yeah. but it's it's a long way to go, but it's still a shot, right? It's, it is, absolutely. That's a really, really positive start. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have a quote here. Um, it says, although there is no cure for autism, there is hope. Absolutely, there is. Do you agree with that I and why? I definitely agree. Um, there doesn't need to be a cure for autism. 
Um, individuals with autism have amazing um, skills and insight and perspectives that we can um, respect mm -hmm. and we can learn from. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether an individual with autism has an intellectual disability as well, perhaps, and might be um, nonverbal um, compared with a um, an adult with autism that's the CEO of a big company and yeah. is able to do a lot of things, which often they are, mm -hmm. um, everyone can have a good quality of life. What we want for our kids usually is for them to be happy and safe and feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. And any individuals can be given that and be supported to have that regardless. So there is absolutely hope and lots of potential. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure that we're providing opportunities for people right. with autism to actually get out there and do the things that mm -hmm. um, they want to do. Okay, and then uh, you've already published a couple of books. Yes. Could you yep. talk to us about it? So um, the first book I published two years ago now, I think, is uh, Talking With Your Child About Their Autism Diagnosis. And it's a guide for parents that breaks down uh, the process in terms of how they might approach telling their child they have autism okay. and um, different ways that they can do that. And then also looks at how they can tell extended family and oh, share information wow. with okay. teachers and educators as well. Mm -hmm. So it was something that um, I was finding in my work, I was doing a lot of um, supporting parents to talk to their children about their diagnosis okay. and there didn't seem to be any resources available for parents that would really clearly yeah. explain that process. And how, how to, what to do about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Step step and, to, and to troubleshoot as well. So what if my child uh, starts using autism as an excuse, for example? Okay, here's your answer. Um, and a lot of that information or all of the information in the book um, comes from my experience with families and also my own personal experience with my son. So um, it um, is something that um, allowed me to gather all the useful information that I have built up mm -hmm. over years of work mm -hmm. and put it all in one place. Yeah, very close yeah. to your heart. Yeah. And uh, there's also another one about Minecraft. Yes, so... You <laughs> mean? <laughs> That's really cute. I saw the cover. Um, so um, it's teaching... Uh, social skills to children okay. with autism using Minecraft. So at our practice in Melbourne, we have run a Minecraft social skills group for mm -hmm. primary age children for a number of years okay. and built up um, lots of information and um, handouts and topics to talk about in social skills groups. Mm -hmm. And I decided um, with the help of um, my publisher, Jessica Kingsley Publishers, um, to actually put it all in a book so other people could run Love the Love the illustration well. and the cover. They're really beautiful. So the illustrations are done by Chloe Amber Scott, who is mm -hmm. actually, I think she might be 17 now, but she's only a teenager. Um, and she um, is just amazing mm -hmm. um, and actually has autism. Okay. Um, and... Um, yeah, it was just brilliant in putting the pictures together for us for mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. um, and we've just found that it's been a really amazing way of engaging um, children to come and to learn about social skills, mm -hmm. but also to practice interacting with their peers. Right. And because all of the children that come like Minecraft, they've already got a vocabulary to use. They already wow. know what they can talk about. Mm -hmm. So it takes away some of those barriers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. where can we get the books? So the Is books, it available already yeah, here so in Southeast Asia? Um, I don't know if there's a translation um, okay. available. So at the moment, it's just been published in English. In English, but it's yep. already available it's in Macau, Hong Kong. It's available on Amazon. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. all Amazon mm -hmm. uh, websites and directly from the Jessica Kingsley that's right. um, website as well. Okay, yep. and a final final uh, gist, like the whole gist of this whole conversation about autism is acceptance and inclusion. Absolutely, yeah. Awareness, um, there should be enough awareness in the community and promoting acceptance mm -hmm. will continue to build awareness but take things to another level to, mm -hmm. to help um, individuals with autism feel like they belong and they're part of the community community, which mm -hmm. uh, is how it should be. Thank yeah. you so much, Raleen. You're an angel. You're amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks so much for Thank having you. me. Join us again next week for another episode of TDM Talk Show. I'm Karen Keith. Good night.